What is going on guys, Modded Warfare here, welcome back to another PS4 video. So in this one, I'm going to be covering something that a lot of people have been requesting in the past that I've never quite got around to, which is just to kind of go over all of the main payloads that you'll find in most exploit hosts and give a brief explanation of what they all do, because there's quite a lot of these different payloads in here. Most people tend to only use a couple of these. So I'm going to go through and just give you guys a brief explanation of what they all do. I'll have timestamps down in the video description and obviously in the play bar as well for each payload that I'm talking about. So if you just want to skip to learn about one particular payload, then just check the timestamps down there and skip to that section. So, and of course, we've had quite a few new subscribers to the channel recently, thanks to that Linus Tech Tips video. So I thought this is probably about the right time that I finally cover this here. So anyway, we're going to go top to bottom, left to right here. So let's get started. So first of all, we have the bin loader. The bin loader isn't actually a payload. It allows you to load payloads from another device like your computer or your phone by sending them over your network connection. So all you do is run the bin loader on the PS4 and it listens on port 9020. And then you can use a payload injector app on your phone or on your computer to inject a payload from your computer to the PS4 and it will load it. So if there's a payload that's not available in whatever exploit host you have, then you can inject it from another device and get it loaded. So that is why that is useful. So next you have the mirror loader. Now the mirror loader works in exactly the same way. You just send the payloads using port 9021 instead of 9020. And Mira is like this kind of development framework for the PS4. So certain payloads require Mira because there are certain functions and features built within Mira that some payloads and homebrew apps take advantage of. So any payload that requires Mira will have to be loaded using the Mira loader. Whereas any other payloads that don't require Mira can be loaded with either the bin loader or the Mira loader. So you can use either one for those payloads, but any ones that require Mira will have to be loaded via that Mira loader. The Mira loader also allows you to load ELF files as well as bin files. Um, I think the bin loader might also be able to do that. I'm not entirely sure. But yeah, that's the difference there between the Mira loader and the bin loader. Next, you have the jailbreak, which just runs the, the kernel exploit, the jailbreak, without running an additional payload afterwards. And then you have the Mira payload. And the Mira payload, uh, like I said, Mira being this kind of development framework that certain homebrew apps use. So when you run Mira on your PS4, it gives you access to the debug settings so you can install PS4 apps. And it also allows you to run unsigned code so that you can run decrypted PS4 apps like, you know, homebrew apps and emulators. So it gives you the ability to do all of that. Although mostly we tend to use Gold Hen for that these days. So Gold Hen has most of the features that Mira has, like the ability to unlock the debug settings to install packages and run unsigned code, install your PS4 decrypted apps but it also has a bunch of additional features built in. It kind of combines a bunch of different payloads into one. So you just run Gold Hen and you get a bunch of stuff enabled. For example, it's got things like an FTP server included, a bin loader included. It also has a kernel log server now included and a bunch of other features like VR support and debug trophy support and many, many other things. I'll have a list showing right here of all the different features that are available in Gold Hen. So yeah, that's why we tend to use Gold Hen. And these are previous versions of Gold Hen because sometimes the latest version isn't the most stable. So you can use an older version if you're having any stability issues with the latest one. So that tends to be why they have the older versions available here as well. Next, you have FTP. So that just runs an FTP server on your PS4 so you can access the file system. Then you've got app to USB, which I covered in my previous video, which allows you to run PS4 games from a USB drive without having to without having to format the USB drive as extended storage for the PS4. So you'll still be able to access the USB drive normally. Then you have the 2DEX payload, which kind of changes the was it target flag or target ID to a test kits target ID, which um, really I believe the only purpose to this was to enable debug trophies, which is built into Gold Hen anyway. So most people tend not to use this. There might be a few other features that, that this might be useful for, but that's the one I remember being the, the big deal about this was that it could enable debug trophies. So then you have exit IDU mode. So IDU mode is like a kiosk console, basically. If you turn on IDU mode in the debug settings, which I never recommend doing, by the way, because it turns the console into a kiosk console. So like when you go into a game store and they have a PS4 on display that you can play, uh, which is like, you know, locked down to only being able to play 
game demos. So that's basically what IDU mode is. And it can be quite difficult to get out of IDU mode. So this, this is a payload that can just disable it if you've accidentally enabled IDU mode. Uh, one of the bad things that can happen with IDU mode is if you go into IDU mode, it tries to update your system software to the latest version. And if you accidentally update to the latest version, then you're not going to be able to exit out, out of IDU mode because you're not going to be able to do the jailbreak anymore if you're on a higher firmware where the jailbreak is patched. And then you're permanently stuck in IDU mode until a new jailbreak comes out for uh, your uh, firmware version. So yeah, that's a, that can be a real problem. So next we have disable ASLR, which is address space uh, layer randomization, which is something to do with the memory of the PS4 basically kind of being scrambled where the memory isn't in the same place all the time. It's dynamic, it moves around. So for better mapping the memory, you can disable this so that most addresses, most memory addresses will stay static. So things will remain in the same place and therefore it's easier to kind of, you know, look through the memory and manipulate the memory of the PS4. So yeah, that's basically what that does, I believe. Then you have the enable browser payload, which seems like a redundant payload now. All it does is enable the web browser, but the web browser is enabled by default anyway. It's just in older jailbreaks from 1.7 to 4.55 firmware. Uh, there used to be an issue where it wouldn't allow you to open the web browser. If you weren't connected to PSN, you would just get an error message. So what this did is it allowed you you know, using the user guide, you could get onto an exploit page and run the enable browser payload and that would unlock the browser so that you could use the web browser even though you weren't connected to PSN. But ever since I think 5.05 firmware, the web browser was unlocked without connecting to PSN anyway. So this payload isn't really required anymore. Next, you have the history blocker, which does exactly what it says here, disables auto opening of the last page used in the ps4 web browser so yeah whenever you open the web browser it will just return you back to the normal landing page when you run the history blocker instead of trying to load the last page that the browser was last on which might be a payload so then it would try and run a payload again when you open the browser so it's just handy to have that enabled uh, that's a permanent payload as well by the way the history blocker and the enable browser uh, payloads they're permanent so you just have to enable them once then you have the WebRTE payload, which of course is used for the PS4 trainer to read and write memory remotely from a web browser. So that's what that does. Next, we have the PS4 debug payload, which is used for remotely debugging the PS4. So it has functions like the ability to, you know, pause and unpause the kernel, read and write memory, remotely call functions, lots of other features as well. And also the ability to unlock the debug output for UART. So if you have a UART connected to your PS4 with a TTL to USB adapter, it can decrypt the output of that to get readable a readable debug log. So it does a bunch of different stuff. It's very useful. There's lots of trainers that use it, mod tools that use it, and you know debugging software that uses it. So yeah, very useful payload. Then you've got the Orbis toolbox, which is kind of a way of adding, I don't know, HUD elements or UI elements to the PS4. Uh, so it can enable some kind of dev kit uh, HUD element stuff like uh, the development kit box that shows up in the top left hand corner uh, which shows things like your hard drive utilization, your IP address, your serial numbers and stuff like that. It can also show the title ID labels which shows the title ID of all your different PS4 apps on the home screen. Uh, those are features that are normally only available in a dev kit but it can be unlocked using the Orbis toolbox also has some other stuff like the ability to show your um, console stats like the you know CPU, GPU and RAM utilization when you're running an app. So it can give you some useful information there. So pretty handy little application for, for adding additional UI stuff onto the PS4. Then you have the web activator which allows you to activate your local PS4 accounts. So PSN activate your local accounts which just gives you access to some features that are normally locked on normal local accounts, like the ability to use remote play or the ability to copy save files to a USB drive. Uh, you can't do that on local accounts, but if they're activated with a PSN account, you can use them. But obviously you can't activate or sign into a PSN account on a jailbroken PS4 because uh, you're on an older firmware. So we use the web activator instead to activate a local account. So yeah, that's the web activator. Next, you have the kernel dumper, which just dumps your kernel to a file on your USB drive. 
You then have the module dumper, which just dumps your modules to a file on the USB drive. I think it also decrypts them as well. Then you have the disable updates payload, which just adds some dummy folders with the same name as the update file to the update folder on your hard drive, on your PS4's hard drive, which blocks the actual update from being downloaded uh, onto the hard drive. So whenever a system update tries to get downloaded, it will always fail and say it cannot download because there's a folder in there with the same name and it can't overwrite it because it's a folder, not a file. So it just gets confused and gets stuck and it's not able to download the system updates. And of course, if you want to re-enable the updates to update in future, there is the enable updates payload, which just deletes those folders so that updates can then be downloaded to your PS4. Then you have the database backup. So this just backs up a bunch of user files like your, your app database, which indexes all of the apps on your PS4, your save data database, which indexes all of your save files, as well as the actual save files and other user data that all gets backed up to your USB drive. And then if you ever have to restore it, because if anything gets corrupted in future, like a database rebuild happens and corrupts your databases, then you can just use the database restore payload to restore those backed up files from the USB back onto the hard drive and fix those issues. So yes, yeah, quite useful to take a backup every now and then. So next we have the Riff Renamer. So this is another kind of redundant payload, I think. I'm not entirely sure why this would be necessary on 9.00, but yeah, the Riff Renamer is... Riff files, by the way, are license files for the PS4. So what this does is it renames the license files because there was this conflict back a long time ago in a previous jailbreak where if you installed an app using Mira, then it would have a different license that would not allow the app to run using Hen. So there were two payloads that would allow you to run decrypted apps, uh, which were Mira and Hen, the homebrew enabler. So if you installed an app using Mira, then it wouldn't run through Hen. Whereas if you installed an app through Hen, I think it would run with Hen and Mira. So the Riff Renamer was just so that if you installed any apps using Mira and they weren't running through Hen, you could run the Riff Renamer, which would rename the licenses so that they would work with Hen as well. So that's pretty much all the Riff Renamer does as far as I'm aware. And uh, yeah, since that was an issue a long time ago and hasn't really been an issue since, so yeah, I'm not entirely sure if this is still a payload that's really relevant nowadays. So next you have the permanent UART, which just permanently enables the UART on the PS4. Again, the PS4 debug uh, decrypts the UART, but you know, you have to run it every single time you reboot the PS4 to decrypt the debug log from the console. Whereas if you run the permanent UART, it will be permanently decrypted so that you know, you won't have to keep running PS4 debug to get the debug log from the console uh, if you have a UART cable connected with a TTL to USB adapter. So yeah, that's a handy one right there. Again, more for developers than the end user. So next you have the game dumpers. So for some reason, there's four payloads here. It should really only be one payload. So normally you have a configuration file that you put on your USB drive that tells the dumper how you want to dump the game. So you've got dumper game, which just dumps the game. Dumper update just dumps the updates. Dumper MGU dumps the game and the update and merges them into one folder so that when you build the package file, you'll just have one package file that has the game and the update consolidated into one file. So you can just install it to your PS4 and you have the game pre-updated. Uh, next, you have the dumper SGU, which dumps the game and the update and then separates them into separate folders for the game and the update so you can build separate packages for the game and the update and if you're unsure about you know what this is for this is if you have like a game on a disc and you want to be able to run it without the disc then you can put the disc in run the game run the dumper dump the game and then turn it into a fake package like a decrypted version of the game basically and reinstall it back onto your ps4 and then you can run that game without requiring the disc anymore so that's essentially what the dumper payloads are for Next, you have the Linux payloads. So there's a bunch of different Linux payloads for different gigabytes. And this is relating to how much video memory is allocated to the system when running Linux. So whenever you're installing Linux, you should always use the one gigabyte payload because it gives the maximum amount of system memory to the PS4, which is seven gigabytes. There's eight gigabytes in the PS4 in total. So the one gigabyte payload gives you seven gigabytes of system memory and one gigabyte of video memory. Whereas if you ran the five gigabyte payload, 
that would give you 5 gigabytes of video memory but only 3 gigabytes left over for system memory. So depending on what you're doing with Linux, you might want more VRAM or more system RAM. So that's why you have the different payloads for different amounts. So there you go. That's what you've got right there. Finally, you've got the fan control. So fan control just allows you to set your fan speed based on a temperature threshold. So if you want the fans to kick up higher, you just set a lower threshold and the fans will kick up higher to try and keep the PS4's internal temperature at that temperature or lower. And of course, if you want the fans to be quieter, then you just set a higher temperature threshold and then the fans will not kick up as high. So yeah, that's how that works. Unfortunately, it's not permanent. So you have to keep running it every time you reboot the PS4. That's the same with most of these payloads. There's, there are a few exceptions like the disable updates payload and enable updates payload. And obviously things like the enable browser history blocker, those are permanent. But most of the other payloads you have to run every time you reboot the PS4. And then last but not least, you've got the mod menu payloads. So there's mod menus for GTA 5 and Red Dead Redemption 2 for different game versions. So you just run the payload for your game version and then run the game and then you can enable a mod menu in the game. Pretty simple. So yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all the payloads covered in the exploit host for 9.00. Obviously, there are some exploit hosts that might have a few more payloads here and there. But those are the main ones that you'll find in pretty much most PS4 exploit hosts. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video or found the information useful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe. And I'll hopefully see you guys in the next video.